Hi, guys. It is, well, it's getting to be a fine Easter day, Easter Sunday, here in the collapse of global industrial civilization with this little thing in the middle of my screen here. Uh, it is Easter Sunday. That would be April 9th. 2023, I believe. And so just kind of as an antidote, I'm sure the Pope had some message of hope. The uh we're gonna we're gonna depope this uh this Easter Sunday with a triple dose of doom uh here on Easter Sunday 2023. And for those of you who don't know or care, I'm Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles. This is my good buddy Elliot Jacobson from Climate Casino. And this is like our fourth show, maybe. So usually what we do, guys, is to sit here and, and blab with each other uh, uh, about how doomed the whole planet is. Uh, but we are going to give you a break today. And it is my great honor to bring on this gentleman down here. I guess he's everyone seeing him the lower screen. We're going to welcome uh, my newest Doomer hero, and this is a fellow named Michael Campy. I'm assuming I got pronounced that right. Yeah, yeah. C A M P I. So all I know about this man, guys, I, I have no clue what what this dude's background is or anything. I discovered him on uh, what what I call this bottomless bottomless well of doomer porn at medium.com where more than anywhere else uh, I, I have found just a great source of uh, daily doom and gloom but one of the voices uh, right up there with Umer Hack so Umer Hack has 195,000 uh, fans and you have, I think you're up to 575, but we're going to bring that up because we're going to make Michael Campy a, a household word today. So Michael Campy, come on and say hi, and then I and whatever Elliot wants to throw in, we're just going to throw questions at you and pitch you on the chopping block. So come say hi to the folks, and we'll just get right into it. All right, then. So I first got into the Doom of Fear through one of your videos. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm sorry, I really apologize. <laughs> it's when like you're at a river somewhere and you're talking about going down into the rabbit hole of doom. And I immediately sent copies of that video to everybody. I said, watch this, watch this guy. He's like the George Carlin of doom. And that was that's what got me started. Oh, really? So how many years ago was that, Michael? Six years, maybe seven. Oh, really? Six? So you've been so you can blame me on your. Uh, oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe you even agreed to come on the show after me. Uh, so, is there anything you would personally like to say to me for bringing you down this? Is is this a rabbit hole you recommend to your friends and family? All the time. Oh, really? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I I recommend it to everybody, and I figure. Out of every hundred people I recommend it to, maybe one of them will watch one of the videos. <laughs> so why why do you recommend people come come down the rabbit hole of the doom sphere? What what possible benefit to one's life does, does getting this information uh, do for a person? What what has it done for your own life? Are you a better person now for becoming a doomer? Oh, by all means. Yeah, and I think what it does for people, at least for the what I hope it does for people, is just make them just wake them up a little bit. Because I live in Chico, California, and the entire population acts as if nothing's wrong. They go on about their business like everybody does, and every once in a while I'll lob a Sam Mitchell bomb into their life and <laughs> <laughs> they'll take a look at it and they'll never speak to me again, <laughs> which is a great way to eliminate excess baggage human wise. Yeah, I'm good at that. I can clear a room just by yeah. walking into it. Yeah, it's a skill, it's a talent. So yeah. what were so six years ago? Tell us about 
Uh, you look like, a, I, I don't know, we're all roughly, what, in our mid-60s? Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, years ago, how would you define your life before you uh, became a doomer? Um, a life of existential dread without knowing why. And then once I started investigating this world, then I thought, oh, that's why. And um, it uh, upset my wife to no end. <laughs> Your ex-wife, you mean? My ex-wife, yeah. <laughs> uh, she would ask me why I kept watching this stuff. And I said, it's just like any news story. It's like watching the OJ car chase. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unfolding story that continues on. And... I'm just paying attention to it. So, I mean, were you just like, like, like I was a real estate agent and uh, and house flipper before mm -hmm. I went down this rabbit hole. I mean, where did you have like a job? And it, yeah, I, I rebuilt pianos for a living. Oh, really? Well, that's OK. Yeah, it was. I mean, I got to work from home um, and it was it's a good gig. I've since stopped doing it, but um, it was uh, it kept me in beer and burritos for a long time, and uh, that's kind of and it gave me a lot of free time to dive into the Dumo sphere in the morning, <clears throat> and I used to spend most of my time reading about health and fitness. That would usually consume two to three hours of my day. And then I saw you, and that all just kind of went out the window. I said, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm even, I, I'm wrestling with the idea of how to time a return to bad habits. It's like, how long should I wait? I mean, if I say I started smoking again now, would we all die before I got sick from smoking? Or would I get sick from smoking and then die? So, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it's a combination of both uh, our age and being uh, doomers. It's like, it, it, you know, every time I think about planting a fruit tree, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, I'm 63. We're doomed. Uh, I, I'm going out there and planting fruit trees. I, I mean, I'm all for planting fruit, but, but you know. What's the real point of, of of planting anything? I don't know. What like an asparagus, which has like a seven year lifespan on it. You know, uh, why go any look farther out than seven years? Yeah. Well, I do a lot more foraging than gardening nowadays. I collect acorns and wild food. And oh, bring... I thought you meant dumpster diving. You mean? <laughs> well, that, that's that's a uh, that's <laughs> wild food. <laughs> now I usually go out every year in October and November and gather up a bunch of acorns and make them into flour. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're literally doing the Don Quixote, uh, Sancho Panza uh, uh, roasting of the acorns. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're absolutely delicious. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had an acorn pancake or not. I, I am embarrassed to admit I have never. And with, with, with all of my readings of my favorite scene out of Don Quixote about the the famous uh, uh, the the famous acorn soliloquy out of Don Quixote, as many times as I've shared that, I have never actually uh, been like uh, you know Sancho Panza and actually enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the acorns. Yeah, no, they're it's an amazing. And once you make it into a pancake, you can have one in the morning, and that's all the food you need for the rest of the day. Oh, really? Yeah, it just fills you up. You don't really need anything else. Well, I, my yard is full of sugar maples, so I got the syrup. So you need to bring you bring the pancakes up to bugs in a jar, and we'll go out there and tap some syrup out of my trees. So we okay. got. We, we got it covered. Elliot, you're, you're it is any time you want to uh, dive right. into this. Well, OK, so what strikes me, Michael, and this is just really current, uh, you live in Chico. And just so people know where that is, that's sort of on the western uh, edge of the Sierras, sort of in the foothills. But I mean, there's a lot of trees and you've got a lot of snow this year there, I'm guessing, at certain times. And uh, you've had fires come very close and you had intense, intense heat waves. 
there and you are sort of right now there's the Tulare Lake that's uh, developing sort of towards your southwest. I mean, you kind of live in the the epicenter of California doom. If any any place in California would be the epicenter, I think Chico is pretty close to that. <laughs> so, I mean, what what is it like there? What it, what is it like <laughs> in terms with with what's sort of falling apart? Well, it's it's kind of like anywhere else. Um, it's just a place to live and there are fires, but I was living in the Santa Cruz mountains when the big fires came through and I got evacuated from those. Then I moved down to San Luis Obispo County for a while, got out of there just before the floods. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Chico's kind of, um, where I live in Chico is pretty insulated from any fires coming through, unless they're really like the one in Colorado, the, the firestorm that went through the city. Um, but you also you also had uh, just last summer, this heat wave, it got up to close, close to 120 or something there, didn't it? Yeah, for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, that's, those are unreal temperatures. And, and I was I was watching that and reporting on it in real time on Twitter because it was a a one-off heat wave, you know. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I think of Chico as, as uh, um, someplace that that was really hip and beautiful, like Santa Cruz, uh, mm -hmm. about fifteen or twenty years ago. But right now, it's just just scary uh, place to live. It's it's kind of uh, it's madness, is what it is. Um, after the fire in paradise, the population of Chico increased by, I think, 15, 20,000 people. So, so let me just say for people who might be watching this, so paradise was the city. The whole city burnt down and mm -hmm. people who were fleeing on the streets to get out, um, they, they were, got burned in their cars alive. Right. So, I mean, this is paradise. Right. That, yeah. And so you are you're close enough to paradise that the refugees from paradise moved to Chico. Yeah, it's about 15 miles from here, but it's up the you side. You know that, that term, the refugees from paradise moved to Chico. That's the saddest, that, that's the saddest statement I've heard. If, if, if that is not a, uh, the refugees from paradise moved to Chico. It actually uh, means that. I wish that had been Michael's quote because that would have been the title of this uh, of, of this video because I, I do you know the, the 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 irony of the 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 refugees from paradise moved to Chico. You know, can you talk about ironic dark black sense of humor, Michael? I, I noticed in Michael's writings, like I read a. I just threw a dart at one of yours today and pulled it out, but it, it it was not one of your more dark black humorous ones. Sometimes uh, you you can tell that uh, like the one I read today, it was pretty it was pretty brutal. Uh, but a lot of his stuff, like a lot of my stuff, is is, is done with quite a a twisted uh, sick sense of humor. Uh, t talk to us about that about about having knowing what you know and being able to sit down and write these brutally honest you, you, you know uh unflinchingly honest uh all all hopium drained from it and then the next day you get up and, and, and write a you know a really funny thing talk talk to us a little bit about that well the dark and brutal ones are usually inspired by reading one or more articles by people who, as you well know, they're just, they're incorrigibly hopeful. Yeah. They, they won't stop. They just, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just, it, it gets me angry. I mean, not be, they're intelligent people and they don't seem to lack awareness, but there's always this, this, blindness when it comes to their pieces about how we can fix things and how things can get better. Usually it takes about three days of those and I'm mad enough to write a brutal article. <laughs> Do you find the hopium addicts 
actually have less of a sense of humor than the doomers. Uh, they, they, as a general rule, I, I find the, the, the Hopium addicts, they don't, they, if they hear a doomer making, uh, you, you know, some doomer humor, they're more likely to get offended by it, the, the, you know, than the, the total, the, the total deniers. Mm -hmm. Well, for, let's see, about, I guess it was about a year ago when I started getting really sick of seeing that stuff that I came up with what I called Denier 2.0. And they were next-gen deniers. <laughs> kind of, you know, they, they admit there's a problem, but they want to call it a problem. They don't want to call it a predicament. Yeah. And they, they're, they're like Catholics or something. I don't know. <laughs> Just, they're, they're, they're so, I don't know what it is about them. Maybe it's just that the, they're still scared. Uh, I, 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 you know, to me, the idea behind getting through this stuff is to get over being scared by it. But I mean, I think the first thing I wrote that you, uh, that you read on your show was a day in the life of a doomer. And it's just like anybody else's day. Yeah. It's not any different. And the only difference is that we see the train coming. And everybody else doesn't see I, you, you know, Michael, I, I I think there's some truth to that in that we still have to eat and brush our teeth and occasionally take a shower and, you know, walk a dog. But mm -hmm. um, I would say that my life feels very different. Um, and it, it feels different because of the consciousness, the awareness I'm carrying with me, mm -hmm. right? So in that sense, you know, all of my actions are guided by that consciousness um, right. and the, the actions, you know, my, my um, willingness to find ways to volunteer, for example, right, mm -hmm. which is, is really big in my life, is guided solely by knowing that there's really nothing else to do that's more valuable than, than trying to save anything I possibly can, right? Right. <laughs> It's all going, but maybe maybe I could save a little a little thing, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's true. We're we're human in the same sense, you know. This sort of othering of people mm -hmm. that that goes on, right? With the other, you you create them as a, a class or a group, and then you can sort of put them down in mass, right? And we we might do that to deniers or hopium addicts or whatever. But I mean, at it, it's. It, it feels like um, there is something distinctly different about the day in the life of a doomer. And I, you know, that's, I think maybe that's the heart of Sam's question as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so define, uh, define what it means to you to be a doomer. What, how, if, if, if people first meeting you, they learn you're a doomer. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you, how would you define the term? I'll define it with a story. All right. We love stories. I think I may have told you this one on the phone call the other day. There was a group of Buddhist students at a monastery, and they were all actively seeking enlightenment. And it was rumored amongst the students that one of them had actually achieved enlightenment. So they went to find him to see what it was like, and they found him sweeping out the kitchen. And they said, well, what's it, what's it like? And he just looked up and he goes, as miserable as ever and went back to sweeping. And that's kind of how I function as a doomer. It's nothing got worse immediately and nothing got better. It was just everything went on as it always has. I kind of view myself, do you ever watch The Walking Dead? Uh, at, believe it or not, I have not. Uh, I, I just, I, I just look out. And I just go to, uh, you know, have social intercourse with my fellow Americans. I don't, I don't need to to watch The Walking Dead. I can visit them whenever I want to. Well, there's one, uh, a couple episodes where they discover all the living people discover that if they drape themselves in the entrails of one of the dead then they can go out and walk amongst the, the zombies and the zombies won't know they're there. Uh -huh. And that, that might be a, a good analogy for how I function. I drape myself in the entrails of the normies. <laughs> I can go out and walk amongst them and they won't know I'm there. 
So do you, so you can pass, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can still pass as a normie. With, oh, like, you, you don't feel obligated in, in, in your daily interactions with normies to uh, to set them straight? Um, I don't all the time. Sometimes at the store when I get tired of answering the question, hi, how are you today? I will answer by saying, <laughs> well, considering we'll all be dead in a few years, I'm doing really <laughs> well. How about you? Most of the time they laugh because they don't think I'm serious. Yeah, yeah. But um, as far as like Elliot volunteering, I do that every Friday. I volunteer at food banks every Friday. And there's also uh, a, a, a group of people from the tribe that was inhabited this area prior to the Europeans that are rewilding an area near my house. So I go down and work with them. And yeah, I do things like that. And it just, it doesn't, seem to bother me anymore i mean i'm not overwhelmed with the idea that i'm going to die because i've known that all along and that, that's your own personal death i, I yeah. think i think the issue i mean our own personal death is one thing but to be a doomer means to understand that wow. that we're destroying the natural world along you know along with us mm -hmm. and we're also destroying human legacy so in some sense there are some parts of humanity that we all value. Well, maybe not Sam, but that the rest of us value. <laughs> you know, like like for me personally, uh, some arts and music and and some sciences. I'm I'm a big fan of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And I I wish that humanity wasn't going extinct because I think there is genuine something genuinely amazing that humans created this this ability, right? So, um, you know, I think I think the thing about our personal death. Is, is part of being a doomer, but it's it's not the real thing for me, right? Uh, the real the real part of it for me is um, the loss of everything that on this planet. The the you know when when I see the suffering of animals on, uh, or I I see the destruction of ecosystems, or I you know it's just the imagery is it all hurts at a level that that's profound, and it's part of being a doomer for me. Is experiencing that pain of collapse in a very visceral fashion, right? Right. Well, for a long time, what I did is I took a bunch of shoe boxes and I filled them with sand and I stuck little plastic flowers in them and I kept them in my car. Oh. And every time I saw an animal that was killed by the side of the road, I'd move it over by the side of the road and I'd put the shoe box oh. in it because I thought, well, we do that for people, why not for animals? They're suffering just as much as we are, more so because nobody cares. You know, over a million small creatures a day are killed on the roads of this country. And me, I just want to see if uh, that that you mentioned this. Uh, I know I am not imagining this, Michael, uh, especially when I'm down there in Florida. Uh, we, we've all heard about the insects on the windshield, and, and, and I will certainly uh, second that that I have no, that I've noticed that same thing. But I'm talking about roadkill. Uh, I, I mean, Florida. I mean, it, it used to be from coast to coast. You couldn't go a half a mile w w without. Uh, I mean, the, you know, buzzards just lining the road because of the roadkill. The buzzards literally have to to eat out of dumpsters now, because at least in Florida, the the roadkill has disappeared. Are you noticing this in uh, where you live in California, or or well, or not? I wonder if uh, it has to do with the animals themselves disappearing. Well, of course, that's exactly what it has to do with. Yeah. So um, no, but, there's no animals left to get run over. No, the squirrels and possums and the odd dog now and again. Yeah. But that's what I see mostly when I was living in the Santa Cruz Mountains after they finished up with the first series of lockdowns. All the animals got used to just having free reign. And then everybody was out in their car again. There was probably 10 times as many things squished on the road. Oh, after yeah, right after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As there were before. 
Um, people get really upset when you mention that. I mean, I've had people get more upset with me for mentioning the, the, the Holocaust level of animal deaths than I have for mentioning doom. I actually got oh, kicked really? out. Yeah, I got, trigger, huh? I got kicked out of a poetry reading once for <laughs> I had did a you write a, did you how write a you, poem about it? Yeah, how do you get kicked out of a poetry? Yeah, I, exactly. I wrote a I wrote a poem called Dead Elephant Hair. And uh -huh. the, whole, the whole poem was about how out. you murder elephants in Africa. You know, what is the right way to murder an elephant? And, and my poetry group loved it. They thought it was great because they understood, you know, I mean, poets are supposed to understand things at a deeper level, right? So so what did you do to get kicked out? Yeah, what was the poem? I'm going to have to, can you remember some of it? Well, the um, <laughs> the, the first thing I think that bothered him, it was, um, had a lot of Black people there and a lot of LGBTQ people were there. And I wore a t-shirt that I had made that had a picture of a wolf on it. And underneath it said, Fur Lives Matter. And that set them off right out the gate. Well, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's going to be a dangerous T-shirt to wear uh, because uh, you know, people uh, take yeah, this very that's, seriously. That's, uh, 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 okay, we will. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, we will. We will uh, skirt on around. Uh, as, <laughs> Sam, maybe, Sam? maybe another conversation another day we'll pick this one up but but for the purposes of this interview we will uh we, we will uh we, we will flip uh the channel here <laughs> see michael you're getting from you're your, getting from kicked your off right reading. now even now you're oh, getting God. kicked off right this topic is getting <laughs> this, I, I, I got it I, I won't say i've never kicked anybody off of glass chronicle you know who you know the only person I have ever slammed the phone down in my in my life because he was so gross. Uh, Dmitry Orlov. Oh. Do you know the guy, Dmitry Orlov? I've he, heard the name. He's got all these. I was all excited about interviewing. I, anyway, like I just I, I slammed the phone. I slammed the phone down on him. I couldn't, I couldn't live, I couldn't stomach no. He was expounding the virtues of Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, it was going on and on about how Kavanaugh, uh, okay, click. <laughs> I don't know if you ever, you ever see the video, the Kavanaugh video that they sliced in with um, uh, clips from, what was that show with, uh, it just poof, it's gone. No. I I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't have any reason to watch a video with uh, oh, what the man looks like. I, I wouldn't know if you put his face up. I would have no idea who I was looking at. Well, the I movie just, was the I, movie was I, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they basically had um, uh, who was the actor in that? The black guy. Uh, Sam uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Yes. Yes. They had him <laughs> examining Kavanaugh. Oh yeah, <laughs> courtroom situation. <laughs> Saying his um his his quote from the Bible like he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> I like that. That's that's um. So just on a, I, I know Sam, this is Sam's interview, but I I just want I, I want you to show your conversation. The three of us. <laughs> I want you to show your shirt to everybody. All right, because you're wearing this shirt that is really great and it's not fully on screen. So I want everybody to just see your shirt once. So you get a sort of move up a little bit so we can all see your shirt you know you got to go the other direction Michael, you heard. You, oh, oh no michael you oh, oh okay yeah there you go all right <laughs> great see yeah he went beyond my my shirt i mean i have a different shirt on but normal my normal shirt that i wear so sorry we are but you're saying so we're we're way so way past we uh at the uh at the effort point yeah, well, the, the interesting thing about this shirt is it's non-denominational, transcends yeah. political barriers. And it's just, it just works for everybody. Do you, actually, yeah. do you wear that in public? Uh, I do. I, I, well, I did. I, when I first had it made, uh, it came in the mail and my wife opened it up and <laughs> got a bit angry with me for having it. So I didn't wear it for a long time. Then I started wearing it a lot when I was in Santa Cruz and everybody loved it. In Santa Cruz. Yeah, 
Um, Chico, not so much, but occasionally <laughs> I get some comments on the shirt. Mostly young people like it. Yeah, yeah. So what year did we pass the point? The point? Of what your shirt said. The point of the, 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 that we said we're beyond it. So when were we at it? It was a while back. I think I first thought of the concept when I woke up the morning after 4th of July. What year? It, it, it was one of the first posts I put up. I actually had a blog called Way Past What the Fuck. Way Past. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and this was a while. This was maybe 10 years ago or something. And I thought you just became a Doomer six years ago. You're... I did become a Doomer, but the, the shirt was inspired by something John Stewart said on his show. Oh, okay. And I had it made after all that fourth of the fifth of July when I got up and just the, the, the sky was so cloudy with smoke from the fireworks. And there had been so much patriotic pablum on the TV the night before. Everybody singing and happy and cheerful. And I thought this is it, it was almost enough to make me want to throw up. Yeah. And that's the, the that that's when I had the shirt in me. Hmm. So ten years ago, so so there, it, it seems to me I, I'm I'm hearing what you're saying a a gradual slide into becoming a doomer. Yeah, I've been aware of what's the various problems, but never the extent of the problem. I knew it was yeah. bad, but I didn't know how bad until things started manifesting themselves quicker than expected. Now you can, uh, if you don't want to go here, uh, you, you can say, I don't want to go here. But like Elliot, it, it seemed, it, it, I have met his lovely wife and they seem to be very much in love and a, uh, and, and a very happy marriage. But is it safe to say, Elliot, that your wife is not a doomer chick? Not exactly. Um she actually kind of agrees with me about everything. Um, but because of her sort of spiritual take with reincarnation and yeah. sort of the whole universe is involved, not just our little planet, um, she can take a, a a bigger view that I'm not capable of taking yeah. in my, my, you know, purely sure. atheistic perspective on, on everything. Prison. So, <laughs> so... She agrees with this, and I am able to share with her the latest Doom stuff. And once in a while, she's like, "Well, that's the only kind of stuff you ever share with me," <laughs> you know. So, you know, it's like I'll, I'll quote I'll quote a headline or show her a story. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, it's not it's not some story about a a puppy and the you know being <laughs> rescued um, somewhere. It's you know. <laughs> Some like some tragedy, some part of falling I mean, out of storm drain or something. I mean, the, the problem with me personally, Sam, I mean, uh, you know, you met me, so you've hung out with me and you, you've got a little taste of this, is that I am really compulsive. And so every morning I am reading the latest news yeah. about news, which, which you do as well because you're picking your stories out. But I mean, I am scouring everything, not for the like what's happening in Toledo or what's happening in, in Japan, right? I'm looking for the big picture stories, right? That are, are sort of, um, you know, the, the ones that sort of knock you out. You can't believe this is happening type of stories, right? And, uh, you know, enough of that happens uh, where three to five days a week, I'll find that, you know, that is like, I want to, I just want to shout this stuff to the world. And, you know, that's, that's what you do, Sam. I mean, you are, you are the person who shouts this and, yeah. and you don't, you don't take these, you know, except for your manga Bay stuff, which, you know, <laughs> well, that's a whole thing. In general, you you do that. You find those same stories, you know, and uh, or those same perspectives. And I think that's what Michael does. That's really amazing. Is that Michael is not somebody who picks a, a particular, you know, little thing. He he's painting broad strokes on yeah. on the situation in ways that enlighten us, 
you know, and that you and I both appreciate that kind of writing at a deep level. So, so Michael, in your, it, it, how much did your doom scrolling have to do? Did, did it have anything to do with the dissolution of your marriage or? Uh, oh, no, we were done long before that. Oh, it was just, uh, it, it was just like, uh, uh, okay, so it was the just the final straw. It's not like that you were that you were in a rock solid loving uh, marriage, and then the doom came in, and that and she, okay, all well, right. Mostly my desire to listen to the traffic reports on the radio that killed it. You did. Um, you don't. You didn't. <laughs> You're just saying that, right? I I did. I, I I was obsessed with the traffic reports. This one radio station, five after and fifteen after. They would have traffic reports, and I would stop everything in the car and listen to the traffic <laughs> reports, and that got to her, I guess. More than more more than the destruction of a planet. Yeah. So I I have to confess, Michael, that we have a similarity here that's kind of really awkward. <laughs> um, um. So where I live in Santa Barbara. There's a huge traffic jam that goes southbound on Sundays because mm -hmm. everybody comes up from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo and this area. Mm -hmm. And then they drive back all at the same time on Sunday evenings. And through Santa Barbara, it goes from three lanes to two. So typically on Sundays, we have miles long traffic jams and people are stuck for an hour just getting through Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I'm always rejoicing. When, when I'm seeing these traffic jams or hearing about them, I am absolutely rejoicing um, in, in my sort of sort of part of my doomer glee. Yeah. That they're stuck in this because of their, their desires, you know, to, to get out for this vacation and go to this place and do this thing. And now they're experiencing hell. Right. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> good for you. So yeah. I don't know whether that's any part of your motivation. It was well, like. Stuck in that more times than I can count because I used to work in Paso Robles. I'd go up there for two or three days and then drive back into LA and almost without fail, I made the mistake of leaving and coming back into town on Sundays. And for so, some reason, it was just horrible. So driving, you would drive through Santa. So for people that don't know, Paso Robles is north of Santa Barbara, about two hours, um, um, an hour and a half, maybe. Santa Barbara was. It's 60 miles from Santa Barbara to Los Alamos. And then another 60 to 70 miles to Paso Robles. So 100. Right. Yeah. Two, two hours. So so you would drive through Santa Barbara going south on a Sunday. So yay, you got stuck. Ha ha. Yeah. And, and you were up there laughing at me. I was laughing at you. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> just to, uh, I, I just Sorry, need, Sam. need to, uh, get us out of a traffic jam here so anyway just I, i'm just watching our somewhat watching our time i don't have my old man glasses uh i mean i could sit here all night and do this but let's talk about uh your history with medium.com i mean i never i had never heard of medium.com until uh october uh, of 2022 i mean all of these years uh, in, in the Doomosphere, and you, you would think that somebody would have brought to my attention in all of these years, never heard of Medium.com. Well, you just came down this, I had already been down this rabbit hole for, well, it sounds like for years before you even came down there. So how did you discover medium.com and and just talk about your your relationship with that and um and, and then I want you just to briefly recommend some other writers in, in addition to but tell us about your own history with medium, how you ever heard of them and how you decided you wanted to throw your voice out there. Well, I interact with a lot of other writers. And um, there was kind of, for a short period of time, there was a, what I call the gratis ad parnassum, means the path to greatness. And you would get a thing up on Medium and you build up a following on Medium and then you'd switch that following over to Substack where everybody actually subscribes to hear your 
to, to read your stuff and you can all of a sudden make a living as a writer. That situation has gotten a little out of control now. It doesn't really work yeah. for everybody. But my initial thrust was to get things up there and see if I could actually get it to the point where it made me some money, which it does. Well, how did you first hear about that? I mean, what was your very, do you even remember what year was it? Was it a particular writer? It, it was it was a writer. It was Jessica Wildfire. Okay, I, she's I, the one who brought you over to. Yeah, so I subscribed to Jessica Wildfire. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm one sorry. of my yeah. favorite, favorite writers out there. So it's great to hear you. You mentioned, I was going to mention her name if you didn't. So, yeah. Yeah. so how many years ago did you start following Jessica? It was about two or three years ago. But you had not started writing yet. Did she give not. you the idea to, to start writing? So how long have you been writing for Medium? Probably maybe a year. Okay, just just a year. So I've, I say I discovered you. I think in November, mm -hmm. and uh, so you've been you you've been on it a, about a year. So I mean, you're obviously an excellent writer. I I know I've. I do apologize for sending a couple of copyright uh, editing things, uh, emailing them to you. I, I just can't help myself, Michael. But you're obviously a very good uh, writer. Now, you are a piano tuner. So, it, it, I, I mean, you, you clearly have written for uh, for a, a lay audience uh, before. Yeah, I was a writing before I ever started working. Okay, well, I figured that somewhere in your background. So, yeah. I mean, do you like? Uh, did you did you take journalism or writing courses or anything like that? I took one journalism course, and it bored the heck out of me. So I decided <laughs> to stop. And and five years for me. So one one quarter for you. Five years of that shit for me, man. Yeah. Um, and then I, I I had friends that worked in the. Uh, the fitness journalism world. Oh, okay. And so I wrote articles for Muscle and Fitness and for Flat okay. and for a couple of online fitness magazines. Um, about that has been a long time now. I de I decided at one point I wanted to write a movie script, so I did that. Oh, really? Yeah. Did it go anywhere? No. Everybody laughed at the title. It's called Fat Guys in Shorts. <laughs> it's about evil health conscious aliens that invade the unhealthiest town in the united states yeah and uh i did i started working on a book that i'm still working on another book actually there's one up that's uh, that i already put up on the medium page and i just What's that book about i'm sorry was, i haven't gotten to it yet it's called stop doing so much shit the ultimate guide to becoming the slacker you were born to be all right. Was that a pre-Doomer or a... It, well, yeah, I had to rewrite a little bit of it because I did write it pre-Doomer. So I had you, to... had to, you had to update it with your new worldview. Yeah, yeah. All the information is still valid, though, because people just do way too much stuff. But, but Michael, you know as well as me, I mean, I, mean, I could be out here. I, I was a house flipper, a successful house flipper and, and real estate agent for years. Anytime I want to make money off of YouTube or Medium, wh what I would be doing is a, uh, you know, is YouTube channels and writing articles about flipping houses. Uh -huh. and, 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 and within within six months, I, I would have more, more fall. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's so, you know that that the the rabbit hole you chose which is the same one as I chose. Uh -huh. There's no money in, 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 in being a doomer. That if, that if you think that you're going to actually make money writing about this, I mean, uh, you're, I like, you're way too intelligent to, 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 to deceive yourself. Like so, so I have a question for you, Sam. And uh, do you know any doomers who, I mean, maybe Umer makes a living off of being a doomer. I mean, yeah, he Umer does. Yeah, you know, maybe Jessica Wildfire makes a living. I'm not, I'm not even sure. And she writes more than just doom, right? She writes. Yeah, she's a little more. 
right? Uh, I don't know anyone. I mean, maybe Jim Bendel uh, makes a living with his deep adaptation stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but uh, I don't know. Uh, do you know anybody who makes a living as, I mean, is there anyone, is, is this a path to wealth? A career path? Is a sick career path. <laughs> I, a I as a, a professor, should be guiding my students to the. Uh... So what do you? So so what's your comment on all that? You, you know damn well that you could be writing about pretty much any other subject on the planet than this, and have more followers might actually. Put put a dollar bill in your mailbox, but you choose, as I do and as Elliot does, mm -hmm. all three of us, we have made the same choice to uh, to to literally uh, handicap ourselves financially for bringing this message out. So just 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 rip on that for a minute. Well, I was just actually thinking about that today as because I go through on Medium, they have all their top writer lists and I go through the top writer list and like somebody that writes about chat GPT, yeah. AI, or like how to make a million bucks on Medium. Those are really popular. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Um, you know, there's a guy, guy, his first name is Jerry. I don't know what his last name. He's a techno guy. And he has three times as many followers as Umer Hake. Oh, really? Oh, wow. yeah. 600, so he has 600,000. What's he at? Right about Umer has two hundred. Oh, does he have two hundred now? Yeah, I, he's got about four hundred, four thousand five hundred. This Jerry guy does, and everybody four he, million five hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. no. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, wait. wait. Umer, I was going to say three times would be six hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does the K mean? Like, if they have somebody has one point two K followers, thousand. that's just twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody has 4.2K, that's 4,200. 4, right. So that's how many that's how many he has. Oh no, Umer has 195K. Oh, okay. Okay. I was just mixing up the numbers and I it, it, yeah. No, it's uh I I, I mean I, I don't under I, I mean I, I'm a big fan of Umer's and obviously, Elliot, if we can figure out a way to bring that dude on the uh, on the show, let's do it. I, I I I think he's probably untouchable. But why do you think, Michael? I mean, you you've been uh, you only I guess you've only been down here a year. Why does Umer have, for all intents and purposes, two hundred thousand uh, followers and nobody else? I, I guess Jessica is, is the queen of the Doomer chicks. Yeah. But she's about 120. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the vast, vast majority, at least the people I follow, mm -hmm. you, you, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, Umer is unsinkable. He he throws out those eight to 10 minute reads every single day. Yeah, yeah. every day. I mean, he, he's incredibly prolific mm -hmm. and he not along with being prolific, he actually is a fantastic writer. He comes up with points that just seem so obvious and so plain spoken. I mean, the mm -hmm. way he writes is, well, is as if, as if anybody could have written it, but he's the one who wrote it. Well, I don't, when you said plain spoken, Listen, we're we're so shallow sitting here talking. And, you know, here here we are, uh, uh, three jealous doomers. I think what he's doing is just it, it, what he's doing is speaking uh, extemporaneously off the top of his head. That's and what's brilliant, it, Sam. He's not. In, it, it's going into a machine and coming out of the other end as as print journalism. I, that, I, I, yeah, dis I disagree. That nobody with you. can even, you can't even type that fast. Elliot, if he, if he was just sitting 
typing, you know, the alphabet over and over and over again to cover that many pages that, that, that he wouldn't have enough hours. I could not do what Umer Hack does if I was literally typing the alphabet over and over and over, get up, it's, you know what I'm saying? And, so, and to actually make a cogent uh, argument. Uh, so I, what I, we, what I, we need to do is ask, is ask chat GPT to start writing our Doomer essays for us. <laughs> and, then, and then we will be just as prolific as, as, I, Umer as, as, as Umer. God, wouldn't it be great if what if we what if we found out that Umer for the is an AI actually getting yeah uh, is actually getting an AI chatbot to uh to write this every day. He just he just right. does like this and goes yeah. off and, and and does his laundry and comes back and <laughs> it takes me about an hour and a half to put together a 750 word piece. And that's approximately a four to five minute read. Right. So if you figure he's doing a 10 minute read, he's probably doing between 1,500 and 2,000 words, which is a real doable number for a writer. So, mean, so my process is more than 1,500 words. When, oh, no. Stop. Yeah. It, when it, I when I write an essay, my process is to uh, just write a first draft. It'll take me an hour to write, you know, twelve hundred words or something like that. Then I I go for a walk. I, mm -hmm. I I don't think about it for a while. I come back, and what I do is I post the thing because I have my own blog. Right, I'll just post it. And the mm -hmm. thing about posting something that sucks is that there it is, and everybody's reading that sucky thing you posted. So you go back and you fix it and you edit it and you re-edit it. And so for the next two days, I'll re-edit the thing and fix it and repair it and strengthen it and, and rearrange the sentences and paragraphs until, you know, there's a really a decent version after about three days. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's that's what it takes for me. I have to sort of corner you have myself. To do that. How well, about you, Michael, do you is it is it first? Uh, is it stream of consciousness? And you put it out there and don't go back, don't look back. I always go back. Uh, I've probably gone back and re-edited three or four pieces in the last week. And I don't change really? it. But I'll See. be walking down the street and <laughs> it'll pop into my head and say, that would just be so much better there. So I'll go home and change it. Yeah. Well, I wrote my, uh, was it my, my third? I wrote my third medium.com piece the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a six minute read took, it took right about two hours, but I was multitasking. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was having other conversations, taking phone calls, you know, while I was, while I was doing it. And, and, and I was commenting to my friend who was just sitting there while I was doing it. Uh, I, I wasn't even locked in a room. You, you, you know, I'm sitting there with company, typing an essay, having conversation, you know, getting so, up. You know, so and, Sam, and, I want to speak well, on your behalf. I want to speak on your behalf here, Sam, because people might not know this about you out in the, the rest of the universe, right? You are one of the best storytellers on the planet. And you just, your stream of consciousness storytelling, if you put that down, that's an essay that is brilliant. You know, the way you just, just come up with stuff by itself. So I, th I think you're a one-off, but I got to tell you in the, in the writer world, and it seems like Michael and I kind of have a similar perspective on this. We actually obsess over this stuff, right? We obsess over our sentences and the organization and, and should this be a comma there or not? There should this word be a different word, right? And, and, I can only, I mean, I don't know. Umer must be a freak of nature to do what he does. <laughs> but I, I do not believe that the guy just creates these things the way you create them. They're, they're too good for that. I mean, you do not sound. Well, there's no way he has time well, that we're talking about to go back and uh, and massage them and, 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 and rewrite stuff. I don't know. We should anyway, ask. Guys, we're, we're probably losing any audio. Uh, yeah, well, that's all right. I'm uh, sorry to go off on that tangent. Yeah, but... we're, we're going we're, we're going off on a uh, uh, on a tangent. But anyway, so uh, your five top writers on Medium. Other than yourself, of not counting Umer, not counting Jessica, and of not, and of course, not counting the best writer on Medium is the man we have on air. So, the other than the three of you, well, you found other one people we should pay attention to. Corrine, 
Corinne Nita. When I read the one, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's good. Corinne uh, Nita, N I T A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, TJ Briarton. It's B R E A R T O N. He's been kind of quiet lately. Yeah. See, this is a whole new one. I mean, I just discovered Corinne last week, just out of nowhere. Uh, good Lord, here it comes. And that was one of the most brutal uh, essays I have ever read. On, uh, on, I mean, where I said, whoa, where did you come from, girl? So T-J-B-R-E-A-R-T-O-N. Never yeah. heard of the man. Tell, is, is it a man or a woman? It's a man. Okay, there's two. Yeah, he's living as a writer. He writes thriller novels. Oh, okay. So he's a, okay. So he's a, otherwise. Okay, there's two. Um. You've already hit on uh, Alan Urban, right? Yeah, yeah. He he's really come up with 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 that a grand masterpiece that he, uh, yeah. Anyone who hasn't read that that full s that book length essay, mm -hmm. okay. So he's yeah, obviously Urban is a good guy. So there's three. I think you read Joe Jamal. It's D J E M E L. I think you might have read one of his pieces. Sounds familiar. He's a good guy. All right. Yeah, I like his stuff. Uh, Richard Krim. C R I M. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's a load of fun. Okay, Richard Krim. I'm going to have to look him up. How about the girls, other than, uh, well, they said Jessica and Corinne. I don't know that there are a lot of them. Well, this is really a uh, a a obvious for obvious reasons. The Doomosphere is a male dominated. Uh, you know, eighty seven percent of my subscribers on this channel are male. Eighty seven percent, and I think that's a pretty good. Uh, I think that's a pretty good back of the envelope estimate on mm -hmm. uh, how many the the, the cut. Uh, the 87, 13. So why is it that the Doomosphere and your, why is it that the Doomosphere is so male dominated? I do not know. And I think we should work to change that. I've been working for how many years to change that? My, my, my essay yesterday is doing everything I can to change that. I mean, we, we have Sandy. Me. You didn't mention Sandy Shellis, right? Well, she's not on me. No, but Sandy had a medium account and she ripped it off. She, she got off, huh? Yeah, she uh, yanked down everything she ever wrote for it, and I don't know what that was about. That's kind of uh, like tearing up a piece of paper that you wrote a draft on and throwing it in the trash, I guess. Yeah. I don't think it's all that good. Um, uh, who else? There's somebody named S.C., and I only just found out recently that it's a woman oh, really? who writes some things on there. Is that her total name, S-C? Or does she, you can't remember her name. last name. That other guy you read, B? Yeah, B. She's well, just, uh, yeah, just We assume name. that's a guy. Yeah. He's going, he's been going book length lately. Okay. And um, God, what is his last name? I want to say Harry Metzger. Yeah, yeah, I, okay, yeah. I follow Harry. Yeah, I like him. I don't him. know if I've read one of his. I don't know if he's quite made the the leap. the the, the collapse chronicle. You, you you know, I'm 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 looking for the real doomers, and you know, this is one of the reasons that you know I've mentioned. So people are all pissed off at me for stopping my interviews. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons. I, I just got sick and tired of the uh, of the hopium where I would be, you, you, you know, that, you know, the setup. We yeah. all know it, that, that you're having this really intelligent interview and everything is good. And, and they destroy it mm -hmm. in the last five minutes. Well, they, after all, they, they, they spell out what's going on on this planet and then they pull this crap a, 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 out of their back pocket and 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 I don't want to. I, I I just. I, I'm I'm sorry. I I just don't want to give hopium soaked apocalyptimist a, a platform. Uh, if you're not willing to come on here, uh, you, you know and and admit 
uh, as you are. I mean, this is why we're bringing you on because we need to, uh, you know, to to bring more people uh, other than the three of us. This is why, you know, I met Elliot about a year ago that we got together, that he is an unapologetic, <laughs> unrepentant doomer. And he's a great guy, and uh, I'm not such a great guy, but I am an apo- unapologetic, unrepentant doomer. I, I I make no apologies for it, none whatsoever. I don't think you should have. There's, to. there's, there's, there's uh, also just this this idea. Of, you can I mean, you can be an unapologetic doomer, but I mean, <laughs> part of that is like this this idea of compassion, right? And and there's a certain compassion that doomers have. That that nobody else has, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you can be you can be a an enlightened Buddhist, right? Like you were saying, who's the guy who's enlightened? Who's the guy who's miserable? Who's sweeping, right? Who's the guy who's the doomer? He's the one who's miserable because he knows the shit that's coming, right? He knows he knows this stuff, and and you go about your life knowing this stuff, and it just it it is enlightenment, and it's the most hurt you could ever imagine a human experiencing is knowing these things right you you can't hurt more than this Mm -hmm. and so it's the kind of burden that very few people carry and and or are willing to carry in their lives in some sense it's the most profound burden you can carry is knowing this stuff right so so to write about it is is, i mean it's an amazing uh gift uh michael that you do this right i mean that that you are being recognized as somebody who is bringing this this knowledge forward, right? And and I mean, I I I am thankful. I found you, by the way. I heard I heard Sam reading you. That's where I got to know you. <laughs> I am not an independent fan of yours. I am a a a um, you know a fan once removed of yours. Via <laughs> Sam. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's what I'm here for is to bring uh, other voices. But getting back to my very first question, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, Michael, as I was unconvincingly explaining to uh, a, a friend of mine recently, I, I, I really, I, I have no interest in uh, bringing clueless moron normies into the, I, I really don't. Uh, it's I I I'd say I wouldn't wish this on Donald Trump. I I wouldn't wish this mm-hmm. burden on 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 my worst enemy. So why do I do it? Is is simply I just think it's the most interesting story in the history of humanity. What's going mm-hmm. on? I I personally think this is the single most interesting story in humanity. If you agree with me that it is, then maybe I have something that I can offer to help you, you know, get your head around it. But it's not saying that if you are, you know, a happy-go-lucky, whatever, normie, that that, that I want you, I'm not trying to prove any of this to anybody. It's irrelevant whether, uh, I, I, I know doomers are right. I, I I know it. And uh, so despite what I'm doing, I, I'm not out there to bring anybody down here. Uh, I am talking uh, to the people who are already down here and, and, and want to have a, a, well, a serious discussion, but also have some fun with it. Uh, it doesn't have to, you know, being a doomer isn't all the, is an all dooming gloom. You, you just have to have a sick, twisted sense of humor. So I was a little bit surprised by our uh, our opening question, but this isn't a debate. I'm just, uh, I, uh, I don't, uh, to hear all views. I, I don't, um, I'm frankly unconcerned with whether or not people know about this. I write about it because it's cathartic. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. I don't have a, a doomy attitude towards the bit. The way I look at this whole thing, there's a couple of different pictures that I draw in my head. One of them is it used to be at Disneyland. They had what's called an e-ticket. And an e-ticket was for the scariest rides in Disneyland. They were the most expensive tickets and the rides were the scariest rides. And my picture of this whole thing right now is we're on an e-ticket ride. <laughs> and there's only one possible outcome. And 
but it's going to be a ride and it's going to be fun until it's not. Yeah. And there's a, a most of actually almost everything I know is a combination of cheesy spy novels and uh, binging on Netflix. But one of the things that I saw on several different spy shows on TV was these people who would go into an incredibly dangerous situation, the, the, the chances of them coming out of it alive were slim to none. And they'd walk in the door and go, this is going to be fun. And that's kind of the way I'm looking at it right now. You know, I, I feel <laughs> the sadness that destroying all this brings. Um, I understand that there's going to be suffering, that there is suffering right now. But it's still going to be fun. I mean, where else are you going to get a chance to do this? It's just that, um, and so, you know, the, every now and again, something I write, something I read will make me start crying. But for the most part, I'm having fun. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I hope that doesn't bother anybody. <laughs> it, it, it's a little bit awkward. I will invest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know um i think the fun thing is important um you know to have a sense of humor is uh the most precious gift we can have um and you know i appreciate i would love to hear your your doomer joke uh anthology if you're talking about having fun um but but uh, Sam, I think we're about ready to uh, close up here. I think we're about. All right. Well, let's wrap it up like I do all of these uh, th these conversations. Uh, how did I wrap up these con for the two years I was actually doing these interviews every week? Uh, okay. I think it was Michael Campy. If you are that, this is it. I, I, I it's been a while. So Michael Campy, if you are. Uh, not sitting here on Collapse Chronicles where you've had one hour to uh, sit here and, and speak your mind to people who are not going to be giving you the stare. You know what I'm talking about. But actually have the mainstream media put a microphone in your face, Michael Campy, here in April of 2023 and say, Michael Campy, you have 60 seconds. 60 seconds to give your message to planet earth on easter sunday 2023 uh, on the same day that the pope i'm sure had his message to humanity what is your message to humanity on easter sunday 2023 you have 60 seconds on your mark get set go i would have to say that despite everything else it really is going to be fun until it's not. <laughs> well, there you go. That's the elevator pitch. <laughs> there you go. That was that was that oh. was six. <laughs> that is the the shortest sixty seconds of our that, lives. That is. <laughs> well, there's not much time left. I was figuring. Oh yeah, <laughs> it could it could all come down in the night in the next sixty seconds. I I, anyway, I think guys. I think that's a good uh, analogy that that 60 seconds is really six seconds, that things are happening much faster and at a much more intense level than uh, anybody has ever you know, thought they are. And so, yeah, 60 seconds and six seconds. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It's great to meet you. I, I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you and, and hearing what you have to say today. Well, hang, hang around here, Michael, after we stop recording for just a All minute. Right. But anyway, guys, uh, it's been fun and uh, we'll have to, we'll have to start bringing some more people on here. Uh, Elliot, start doing this more often again, but that, but they have to be true doomers. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopium, hopium free zone. Anyway, guys, it has been fun and uh, we'll see uh, who we can drag up into the hot seat uh, sometime in the future. Thank you, Sam. Bye, guys. Bye.